Greetings! Before we get into this week's episode, we just want to give a shout out from our sponsors for this week at Runesmith and Eldermancy. They have just launched their Kickstarter for their brand new book, Stibble's Codex of Companions, which is live on Kickstarter now until March 20th, 2020. If you haven't heard of Runesmith, check him out right here on YouTube. Logan does some amazing work and that's sure to carry through into this incredible Kickstarter. This new tome for the 5th edition of the world's greatest role-playing game brings over 70 new creatures to the game, all of which can be companions for your player characters. The book is packed with new feats, spells, monsters, including feats which give almost every class the option to gain a powerful familiar or companion, which can aid you in combat, exploration, and more. I have absolutely fallen in love with this content from the moment I saw the imagery of it and the concept of adding companions to the world of Dungeons and Dragons. It's adorable, I love it, and I want it. So check out Stibble's Codex of Companions, which is live now on Kickstarter until March 20th, 2020. You can follow the links in the description below to get in on the Kickstarter. And if you happen to miss out, those links will also have the latest news and updates for how you can pick up the book after the Kickstarter is all over. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are taking on a bit of a monumental challenge. We are looking at all the spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition across all the source books, across all the classes, although not including Unearthed Arcana. And we are going to pick our top spell of each single spell level, starting all the way from cantrips all the way to the big ninth level spells. Now, in trying to choose this epic list of 10 spells, one of each spell level in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, we quickly realized that Monty and I could not agree. <laughs> With such a large range of spells to choose from and different playstyles coming into effect, it was absolutely impossible for us to choose one of each spell level in Dungeons & Dragons. So what you're going to see is us debating each of our top choices for each spell level in the game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. It goes without saying that you're never going to be this restricted in actual play, choosing only one spell across an entire level. Perhaps you bards out there might they'll get some useful ideas for your magical secrets from these lists. But on the whole, these spells represent what we feel are the top tier spell of each spell level across all all the classes. There's a lot to go through and we're not going to be able to spell out all the rules for each individual spell, but let's get rolling. Okay, cantrips. What is the best cantrip in the game? My choice, being a person who enjoys damage dealing magic, went with Eldritch Blast because it is for me one of the most reliable and most useful damage dealing cantrips in the game of Dungeons and Dragons. Not everybody has access to this cantrip, but when you do, especially if you're a warlock who can take the right invocations or find other ways to empower your Eldritch Blast, there is a very reliable way to dish out damage even without blowing through your spell slots and just be a good force of damage dealing in combat. See, damage is great, but I don't think da there's so many ways to deal damage in Dungeons and Dragons that from a cantrip, I want something special. And I don't think there's anything more creative or inspiring or flexible than minor illusion. The fact that you can use this to create small visual images and sounds means that you can use minor illusion as a combat trick. You can use it to trick your enemies and foes in exploration and social interactions. And it also just provides a lot of fun role-playing opportunities. I think it's the best cantrip in the game. It's a hard one to use, but it is so flexible and interesting that with the right DM, it will always make an impact in the game. Following this theme of flexibility and versatility, when we get to my pick for the best first level spell in the entire game, I think hands down that is Find Familiar. You will find no better first level spell that combines an awesome role playing opportunity, giving you a fantastic little animal companion, with so much utility. 
that this spell brings. The fact that you can see through the familiar's eyes, that you can use it for combat tricks. I think I'm really feeling that right now in a party of three characters, two of which have familiars. <laughs> just how much of an impact this little first level spell has on the entire game. I think we talked we can talk exhaustively about how amazing this spell is and how versatile it is. In fact, we have, we've got a little whole video about it. I think hands down it's the best first level spell in the entire game. Now, I've got to say my opinion might have been a little swayed by the fact that I knew you were going to pick <laughs> Find Familiar. So for the sake of being different, I looked at other options. And I went with Healing Word. Hmm. For me, Healing Word is by far the most reliable and useful healing spell in the game. Having it at early levels, it is the clutch option to save a teammate who is going down in combat. Usually we've talked about how healing is not the most reliable form of magic in Dungeons & Dragons. And there's a lot of options that you would be better using a spell slot for something else. But Healing Word is one of the rare exceptions to that, where mm. I do think that it is endlessly useful and can really save the day in a lot of situations. Because of that, taking Healing Word as your main healing spell at early levels can actually be the best choice for a healer in a party. I think Healing Word is the most surefire insurance policy most adventuring parties have. So I agree. I think it's powerful and utterly indispensable. I just think that find familiar, I mean, you could have your familiar administer a healing potion. For second level, I actually had a really hard time mm. picking my top Me spell. Me too. I think it was this was a really tough level to pick the best spell because they get really versatile. Yeah, and when we look at versatility, I, I tried to narrow it down. It took me a few hours to actually pick which one I was going to choose as my top. And I have decided on invisibility. Just because of the amount of options it gives you for either sneaking into locations, hiding from enemies, uh, being able to choose the party member that you want to turn invisible and use that to your advantage. A clever player will find a million and one ways to use invisibility if they have it in their arsenal and try to use it as often as possible. And it's always fun, it's always cool, and it's always useful. It's one of those spells that... Some spells you kind of need to wait for the right circumstance. Invisibility, there's almost no wrong time mm. that invisibility isn't an option for how are we going to solve this problem? Usually it's, I think if we turn somebody invisible, there's a solution here. Yeah, it's very flexible. Uh, and I think its utility is pretty unparalleled. But for second level spells, I really have a hard time ignoring the, ut the damage dealing utility that is spiritual weapon. Uh, spiritual Weapon slices and dices as a bonus action, and it doesn't even ask for your concentration. This amazing little spell is one of the most reliable ways to get some extra force damage to weaponize your bonus action. The fact that it doesn't require concentration takes what is already a really good spell and kicks it into overdrive, because the fact that Spiritual Weapon can be combined with another concentration effect means that your character can have something really potent happening while you're still contributing to the damage rate of the entire battle i think it's it, it's an indispensable spell and while clerics have the monopoly of it divine soul sorcerers and oath of conquest paladins love getting in there and i think it's a really compelling pick for a bard that wants to deal a lot a bit of extra damage with their spells too as we move on to the third level spells i really struggled to pick one solid choice for third level spells because third level is really when the spells just become amazingly diverse and it's so hard to pin down one spell that speaks to the amazingness that is third level spells except for one and that is fireball if you only need one spell should you take fireball I think the answer is pretty close to yes. This is an incredible and iconic spell in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, and so many problems can be solved just by blowing them up. I think what's really cool about the third level spell options is when you and I came and compared our lists, my second choice was Fireball, and your second choice was the one that I chose, and that's Counterspell. 
I am undone. <laughs> yes, Fireball might be the greatest third level spell, but Counterspell will always beat it. Counterspell is the clutch situation winner in all of Dungeons and Dragons. You can save your entire party. You can undo a combat encounter. You can give your party the edge when they need it most, all with a well-placed counterspell. A well-placed counterspell was the climax of the first season of Critical Role. The next category, which is going to be fourth level spells, is a rare stop on this list where Monty and I easily agreed on yep. what the best choice was. This choice for fourth level spells is so far ahead of all the others. I actually find with a lot of characters, once I choose this spell, I'm kind of ambivalent about the other fourth level spells. There's some good ones in there, but you could tell me that this is the only fourth level spell that I could ever take and I'd be totally happy, happy with it. And that spell is Polymorph. Polymorph is an offensive buff a defensive buff, a utility buff. It does anything and everything. If you have a party member who's about to die on the battlefield, they're low hit points, they're trying to get out of an intense situation surrounded by enemies, turn them into a giant monster. Now they have a hundred or more hit points and can dish out a ton more damage. If your enemy is trying to intimidate you and says, what's the best you've got? You can answer and reply, we have a T-Rex. There, there have been moments in campaigns where facing a dragon who's swooping in towards you is terrifying. And then suddenly, you turn one of the party members into a T-Rex, the barbarian hops on its back, and now you have a barbarian riding a T-Rex into battle against a dragon. A barbarian riding a T-Rex fighting a dragon in a blasted wasteland might be the iconic heavy metal album cover. <laughs> You can transform into giant eagles to fly across long distances or transform into small animals to escape from openings. Well, there are limitations to what you can transform into with the polymorph spell, and there are uh, uh, points of debate over the mental capacity of creatures once they have been polymorphed. I think it goes without saying that this spell is the standout choice for fourth level spells and unquestionably one of the most powerful spells in the game. And the only other candidate for a spell that would be more powerful than Polymorph, Conjure Woodland Beings, only gets that spot because you can conjure creatures that can cast Polymorph with it. Continuing on our gauntlet of tough decisions, we come to the fifth level spells, where fifth level spells are this transitional point where you get the repeatable utility of the lower level spells because you get more than one fifth level spell slot where after this point it's not until very high levels that you get more than one sixth seventh eighth level spell slot so fifth level spells are this point where you get the apex of power that you can use multiple times across an adventuring day so it's really tricky to pick the best fifth level spell but for me time and time again the answer to this has always been wall of force this is such an encounter ending staple spell of every wizard that I play. I love how this spell can be positioned in an offensive or defensive way, how it can be used to trap enemies or prevent them from pursuing the party. It is so flexible and so creative, and I think it stands out amongst the best of what it means to be a wizard and a magic user in Dungeons and Dragons. I can't argue with any of those points. It's an amazing spell. Again, me being a big fan of dealing a lot of damage in really cool ways, I went with Animate Objects. That's more than a lot of just damage. There's so much utility packed into that spell too. Animate Objects I've seen do some of the most fun things in the Dungeons & Dragons games. Not only that, but I've seen so many enemies ripped apart by gold. <laughs> And it is such a fun way to use animate objects. There are situations where maybe you're in a location where you don't have your weapons on you. But guess what? You can turn all the chairs into a fighting force for you. <laughs> I have seen people use animate objects to animate giant dragon skeletons for the purpose of intimidating enemies. It is such a fun spell. And once you look at all the options available within it, 
creative players will just have a blast with this one. I've seen a creative player animate a boulder and have that boulder walk itself to block a passageway. <laughs> it's a very flexible and powerful spell. It's it's incredible. Uh, and I think that it has more utility than just in combat, which is what makes it such a standout option. When we get to six level spells, this is another one that I did have a bit of a tough time with, but I ended up settling on an enhanced version of another one of my favorite spells. And I went with Mass Suggestion. Mass Suggestion doesn't require concentration. It can target up to 12 creatures and lasts for 24 hours. You can undo an entire budding combat encounter simply by suggesting that the whole group of enemies surrender or walk away or go to the nearest beach and count sand. There are a lot of creative options here and this spell can just undo combats before they even get started. This, this spell can completely overturn an entire social interaction. If you're in a council session and there's less than 12 people arguing with you, just mass suggesting them all to agree with you. There's so much creativity behind what you can do with that spell, but I think its creativity and flexibility is only matched by my pick for the best sixth level spell, and that is Contingency. Nothing rewards you more than being well prepared and having a plan. And having contingencies in place will save your character's life in so many cases. I love choosing the spell with my wizards. When I play high level bards, it is always a pick for my 14th level magical secrets because you can just apply this in so many ways by combining it with several of the other spells you mentioned. Whatever situation you are most worried about happening to your character, you can now have an answer for that. Some of my favorite contingencies include using Dispel Magic as my contingency if I'm ever subjected to an effect that renders me incapacitated, or a contingency that casts Mirror Image on myself when I say the word Giggle Shorts, or a contingency that turns me invisible when a hostile creature comes within five feet of me. As we move into 7th level spells, we start seeing effects that are going to allow the players to really reshape the game. And my favorite pick for the most powerful 7th level spell in the game, I think is so far and away outside the power curve of all the rest, there's basically no competition. And that is Simulacrum. This powerful spell, though expensive in requiring its material components, allows you to produce a copy of a creature made of snow. Now, it is very popular to copy yourself, but many disregard the fact that you can copy anybody with Simulacrum, and then they are under your, that copy is under your control. So as long as you can capture somebody, you can make a Simulacrum of them. So you don't necessarily have to make a Simulacrum of yourself. That's just the easiest and most obvious answer. But think of all of the other dangerous creatures and allies and monsters in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons that you could duplicate with this spell. I've never considered this. <laughs> I have not once considered that is okay. You capture a lord or like the head of the guard, create a simulacrum of them, and then just walk with them into the kingdom with them being like, they're under my watch. Whatever. It's, that's brilliant. You can make a copy of your cleric or your paladin or make a copy of a major NPC in the campaign. And that NPC is now friendly to you and obeys your commands. If you can capture the big bad evil guy's right hand henchmen and make a simulacrum of them, that opens up a whole world of possibilities for infiltration. Oh yeah. Oh, it's, it certainly does. In my books, if the player characters create a simulacra and have them falling around, I just build the encounters assuming there's an extra player character in the party now. That's that's the way I address it from a power perspective. The problem actually of dealing with the spell is that now you have one player that is effectively getting two turns, and that itself slows the game down a lot. Simulacrum is one of the best 7th level spells, but it's a spell that's going to require you to use your downtime to actually effectively take use of it. It does take 12 hours to cast, and yeah. material components. So when I was looking at 7th level spells, even though you're going to argue that this one is by far and beyond the best spell and one of the most powerful spells in the game, I like to think more about spells that I'm going to use all the time that can derail an entire combat encounter. <laughs> and I went with Force Cage. 
Now, what's interesting is my experiences with Force Cage are less as a player using them and more having Monty as a DM <laughs> use it on me. And the amount of anger and frustration I have had against you while you trap me in a force cage and then throw cloud kill at me and just a, a deadly combination of threats where I am like, I don't know, I guess I'll die. <laughs> It is incredibly useful and versatile, the way that you can use Force Cage to just undo a combat encounter. With that extra little provision that Wall of Force doesn't have, where Force Cage says you actually have to make saving throws to escape it with teleportation. And that li those two little extra nasty things, no concentration lasting for an hour, and the fact that te even teleportation might not get you out of a Force Cage, just make it beautiful. I remember the first time you ever trapped me in a force cage and I went to teleport out and you told me that there was a saving throw and I remember how angry I was. <laughs> and it's moments like that that make force cage one of my favorite spells in the entire game and in my opinion, a must have for seventh level. When we move on to eighth level spells, this is actually a very hard point for me in the entire list of spells and spell levels, eighth level spells, in my opinion, are actually some of the weakest. Eighth level spells kind of suffer from the middle child problem of the high level spells, where the first two levels, like sixth and seventh level spells, are like the first are like the first high level spells that you get, and you're like, wow, these are so powerful and amazing. And then ninth level spells are amazing, but then in between them you get these eighth level spells where you're like, these are good. But I think that on the whole, there are more really good 7th level spells that I would rather take over an 8th level spell. Since that's not what we're discussing today, I looked at the list of 8th level spells and I settled on Feeble Mind. Feeble Mind to me is one of those spells that, above all else, is just really fun to describe what's happening at the table. <laughs> Getting hit with Feeble Mind or hitting an enemy spellcaster with Feeble Mind and just taking down their intelligence and turning them into a blibbering idiot and then having them not being able to make a saving throw for days. This just is such a ridiculous way to take out a prominent villain in a campaign. Feeble Mind is fun to use, effective, and the description of its effects and the longevity of how long it lasts makes it my choice for 8th level. So, while I struggled and I was tempted to say spells like Clone or Demiplane for their world-shaping kind of out-of-combat utility, I think I'm going to go with, for my pick for the most powerful 8th level spell, I'm going to go with Maze. Maze? Yeah, because... Maze, you just get to point at somebody and they're gone. Poof, they disappear. You banish a creature to a demiplane and they are gone. There is no saving throw to resist Maze. I may have missed that point and that sounds really incredible. So even a legendary creature who has legendary resistance, you can just take them out until they can make that intelligence check. Yes. You're never going to be able to pull this off against a really powerful big bad evil guy like a lich but even in those cases that's not the point because even if you try to use maze against a powerful foe like a lich that has a great intelligence score they still have to spend their action on their turn to escape the maze with an intelligence check so you've taken them out of the battle for at least one round you don't get to attack them you don't get to damage them they're protected while they're gone but that one turn alone, no contest, might be all you need to turn the tide. So finally, we come to the ninth level spells. I don't think there's any controversy behind what we're going to say. This is the only other time that Monty and I agreed on this list, other than Polymorph. And it's pretty clear cut who the winner of the ninth level spell is. If you haven't guessed it already, it's Wish. Wish is unequivocally the most powerful spell in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and deservedly so. It does almost anything in the game. 
replicating the effects of any other spell of 8th level or lower, or creating all sorts of other effects according to your imagination. You have to be a little careful with Wish because a clever DM might use your wishes against you just like the great genies of legend. But if you're using it to recreate a spell effect of any spell that you didn't already have access to, this is a great use of Wish. The versatility here is endless. One thing that I will note is that the Wish spell in the spell description says that a complex or strange Wish may simply fail. And to me, as a dungeon master and as a player, I think that this is the fairest thing that a dungeon master can do with moderating the power of a wish spell. For example, if a player comes to you with a really sort of clever wish, like, I wish that all wishes by wish-granting entities always be granted according to the intentions of the person making the wish and not the intentions of the wish-granting entity as a way of kind of subverting the whole twist the wish thing, you can simply have that wish fail, and that's what I would do as a DM. There's never any way that a player can cleverly word a wish and force the dungeon master to grant that wish, because the dungeon master always has the power to say, the spell simply fails. So that kind of arms race, the DM always wins. Um, but you can still get clever with all of these things, and even if you avoid all of that controversy at all, it doesn't change the fact that having a spell that can be any other spell of 8th level or lower is incredible. I wish that I could make a player character that can take all of the spells we just mentioned. <laughs> well, you could try multi-classing. There would be a few different multi-classes yeah, that you would have be, to do. Yeah, be required. I think, I think you'd be, it would be really tricky to get all of these spells. And certainly, if you made a character that these were the only spells that you could cast, I think you would be very happy and satisfied with that character. That said, well, one character can't get every single one of the spells on this list. Wizards come pretty close. And so, while it is a fun thought experiment to think about what the most powerful spell is across the entire board, there's always subjectivity involved, and there's also the specific context. Polymorph might be the most powerful spell of fourth level, but it might not be the most powerful fourth level spell that you can use in those circumstances. The other thing to keep in mind is you're going to notice in this video itself that Monty and I, while trying to pick the best spell of each spell level, were unable to agree most of the time. This means that although we've shared our opinions with you today, if you have a different favorite spell, that's absolutely fine. There are so many great spells out there, and depending on the type of character you're playing and the situations you're finding yourself in, there might be options that far surpass the ones that we've presented in these lists. Monty and I could barely agree on any of these, <laughs> and so it goes without saying that you might disagree as well. Honestly though, there are so many great ways to use magic and half the fun is trying out new and exciting spells that you've always been a little bit curious about. If you're sitting down for the first time and are wondering, what's a good spell choice? Hopefully this video helps you out, but it's not our only opinion on great spells in Dungeons & Dragons. If you can take these spells with your character or your class, you should seriously consider them. But they're not all golden hammers. They won't get you out of every single situation that you're always going to face in the games of D&D. So don't forget the other spells that we didn't mention in this list because they might be the right spell at the right time, which makes all the difference in the world. So these have been our picks for the best spells of each level in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you have other choices other than the ones we presented, tell us about them in the comments below. If you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos covering all the great spells in Dungeons and Dragons right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.